Today we're going to discuss uh, our topic is called uh, who owns that it's an understanding of architectural and structural workflows um, so today what we're going to do is cover um, kind of how to manage the architectural and structural models um, whether it's in-house you know architectural and engineering firms or you know separate consultants and um, other clients and such um, so oops I went an extra click there we go so uh, what we're going to do today is we're going to determine um, what's what's required by both parties and how to manage um, the content when it is when the similar content is required by both parties um, and in that case then we're going to go ahead and develop the proper workflow standards utilizing things such as work sets visibility graphics filters um, you know discipline and coordination views and things like that and then again Find, maintaining graphics and uh, and the models and managing the updates and uh, coordinating changes and such. Um, and then after that, we're going to um, talk about Midwest University with CTC and then answer any questions that you may have at that time. So uh, to the demo and uh, my little example set here. So I'm gonna, first, I'm going to start off by jumping into the architectural file. So um, you know, basically the way it goes is this. Uh, there's you know, kind of architectural typically starts first, um, but really when the whole coordination effort and the workflow process begins is um, the first day that the consultants receive the files, and even before that, really, um, you got to have some type of a BIM kickoff meeting. Um, and in this meeting, you'll discuss, you know, various things, what version of Revit is everybody using, make sure we're all aligned, is everybody using 2014, 2015, um, is there any AutoCAD being used? In, being used? Are we doing ArcStruct and MEP, or is it just ArcConstruct and MEPs and AutoCAD? Or are we coordinating with Civil? Do we need shared coordinates? Things of that nature. And hopefully, everybody's been doing that for a number for a, a few projects by now. And if not, you know, we've we can assist you there if necessary. But um, so, uh, and then at, during this meeting, you can also discuss between architectural and structural, who's going to own what or who needs what, okay? So obviously with architecturally, you need floors, you need walls, uh, you need to show the columns just for simple documentation purposes, uh, but then um, some of you may use, be using your Revit models for renderings, um, for doing quantification um, material takeoffs and things of that nature. So there's a lot of data that the architectural model is required to have. Structurally, um, we need to have columns. We need to have all of our framing. We need our floors. We need to be able to run analysis on the models if necessary. If um, if you guys have figured out how to get that to work, <laughs> it's been kind of a process and it can be a little finicky at times. But that being said, so there's going to be some duplication of uh, work efforts here. Now, in some cases, you know, structurally, we don't necessarily need the walls. We can reference what the architectural has, but then we're going to see all your finishes um, and, you know, like the brick and the jip board and, you know, airspace and insulation. And we don't necessarily care about that, but we can't directly turn that off if everyone's modeling walls, uh, which is pretty traditional to how Revit works anyway. You just, it's all one element. So we can't necessarily, we can't control that. So we end up having structurally ends up they end up having their own set of walls just because of that in, as a whole and then in some cases you know you're doing a little bit of um, uh, analysis based off that as well so it kind of depends on you know what you guys decide in the meeting um, so um, and then you can kind of discuss management techniques whether you're going to use work sets whether you're going to use um, just control the visibility graphics of the Revit link um, and um, so it kind of depends on, you know, how how in depth it, it's going to be and how much overlap there really needs to be between the two projects. Okay. In this case, I'm going to kind of highlight some both techniques. We're going to show a little bit of copy, um, uh, using work sets to control the visibility of elements. Show you how to just edit the Revit link um, and things and things like that. So, um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start off by jumping into the 
structural file, which is empty at this point. So I'm going to go ahead and link in my architectural building. Um, we haven't determined yet at this point if civil is going to be on board. We, and even if we did, we don't have a file yet. So, and I don't have a file to use. So I'm just going to do my standard origin to origin linking. And here it comes. And, um, you, you know, depending on the current view that you're in, you're going to see some kind of hodgepodge of stuff. Um, likely you're not going to see any walls. Um, you'll see a lot of furniture, floors, ceilings. Um, and that's because of how those elements have been defined by the architects. And right out of the gate, all the default in architectural models, all walls are set to non-bearing. So by, by rule, structurally, we don't see any of that. Um, so we need to start generating what are called coordination views. Um, so I have some coordination plans already set up in this particular file, which allows me to see where the architects have placed walls, and then I get to also see stairs, doors, plumbing fixtures, and you know topography in this case. I get to see all a bunch of stuff that I don't really care to at this point, but that's the point of coordination views. You see everything so you can make sure that things are in alignment with each other. Okay, um, but I'm also going to need to create a coordination 3D view here because currently I don't have one. So I'm gonna switch back to my 3D view that I created. Um, and, oh, I do have it set to coordination, so that just means I turned off stuff that I shouldn't have, like my walls. How about that? So this is what it would look like without that. So I'll switch back to the default of structural, and it's very similar. I see my windows, my ceilings. I see some roofs. Um, I see a couple of floors here as well. So a lot of stuff that uh, a structural model may need. Um, I see some columns and uh, a lot of stuff that, obviously a uh, structural model does not need so but I don't see any of the walls so switching to a coordination gives me that okay so usually the first thing that that comes up is who's you know managing the grids on just about every single project that I've ever worked on architecturally they create the grids first which is fine. It helps them lay the building out and put things kind of where they want to put place them uh, but then once the structural team gets on board it's pretty common that they should be taking ownership of those grids and determining if the layouts need to be adjusted at all and um, adding additional grids as necessary. So the first thing we want to do is utilize a tool called Copy Monitor to create these grids and provide a link um, to the architectural model so that if the architects decide to change a grid or accidentally change a grid, um, we get flagged right away upon receiving an update. So we're going to go ahead and utilize Copy Monitor to bring our grids in. And at the same time, we can go ahead and utilize Copy Monitor to manage levels as well. Now, we don't necessarily maintain ownership of these levels, but it's always a good idea to have a monitoring effort created here so that in, in the event that the architects decide to adjust the floor to floor heights by a couple of inches, we know about it um, so that you know we're not relying on our technicians to verify that in a section or, in a, or an elevation or relying on the architects to send us an email or give us a phone call saying that they made that change. Um, so I can go ahead and copy monitor these in, select what types I want to use or what families I want to use for my representation. Same with grids. I can go ahead and put and insert my own bubble types and um, you know kind of set this up exactly to my company standards. We do have tabs for column walls and floors. Um, I typically don't recommend monitoring them simply because, um, well, even copying them for that matter, one, they're 95% of the time not right, and that's okay. Uh, you know, architecturally, they're just, we're just throwing things in there just to make sure that we have something to take the place, placeholder elements. Um, we're not using them for anything else other than that, and just kind of gauge spatial uh, requirements of such. Um, and then if, any, if anybody's done copy monitor with walls, uh, in the past, we all know how much of a, of a pain it can be to manage, maintain, clean up, fix, adjust, position. Um, it's still a problem. Uh, one of the biggest problems is how it manages openings within doors and windows. So I just try it if you want. I'm still not going to recommend to anybody that they go ahead and copy monitor walls. Um, same goes for floors if you've got openings and specialty openings and you know it's, it's not really worth it 
So I'm going to stick to levels and grids for this example. Um, so now I'm going to go ahead and do my copy. We're going to check multiple, select everything, and filter out all the others except for my grids. Hit OK. Then hit my Finish button. Gives me a copy monitor, and I should see a heart rate monitor symbol that pops up at every single grid, letting me know now that they have all been copied in. I've got my own grids, and we're tied back to the architectural model. So if that changes and I get a new version of the ARCS file, I'll get notified. I'll get a coordination review warning that pops up. Okay, um, And, um, you know, just for the sake of doing it, I'll go ahead and grab the architectural levels. And Well, I guess I don't need to. I already have them. So in the event where you've gone through and created levels already, you can go ahead here at this point and monitor them. So I can go ahead and monitor my level to their level. And if the roof levels change, then I get flagged. Okay. But I didn't actually copy them because I already had them placed. And I, I guess you can say I, I cheated. Um, but so I'm going to go ahead and I can just do a quick monitor. I'm not copying anything. And, and this is providing that link between everything. So then I would go ahead and, um, you know, start creating my, you know, replacing the columns, putting in my foundations, whatever, um, at this point. But what should also happen on the flip side then, so I'm just going to go ahead and save this, and while it's saving, switch back to, oops, there it is, my architectural file. Now on the flip side, when the architects receive the structural file, we should also monitor the structural grids and copy monitor any additional um, intermediate grids that have been placed um, since we sent the file to them. We want to do this so that if structurally they decide that some grids need to be manipulated um, to make the building structurally sound and to add uh, and to make it you know more supportive, we need to know that. So I'm going to go ahead and <clears throat> link the structural model in to my architectural model. Again, origin to origin. And then I'm going to come down to my floor plan. Make sure that they are turned on, which they are. There we go. Here's my structural file. And uh, I have again, cheated and linked in a more updated version of this. Um, but the process that we take here is the same without the copy part. So I'm going to go ahead and show you how this works. So I've got two sets of grids. I will go collaborate, copy monitor using the structural link, and I'm simply just going to monitor these. So the similar how I did the levels in the structural file, I'm going to monitor the grids in the architectural file. Um, and unfortunately, it is a one at a time manual pick and pick to get these to monitor each other. Um, you can't do a window selection or anything like that. So it's, you got to be careful that you pick the right set of stuff. Okay. Um, and I highly, highly recommend that um, architectural Revit users do this. Um, grids will shift even if it's just a half an inch or, you know, hopefully it's not a half inch, but if, even if it's just a small amount, they shift. And if you've always got the structural file turned off, you'll never know that things have shifted. Um, so it's very, or if you've always got the structural grids turned off because you don't want duplicates and your grid bubbles need to be what's shown on your documentation. So now that I do have these monitored, I can start managing graphics here. So in this case, I've got some duplicate information here. So um, structurally, they've gone ahead and started laying out some information here. I've got walls placed. Um, I've also, I think, got columns placed here. So we've got some duplicate information going on. So this is where uh, we can decide we need to start, you know, going back to the meeting that we had day one and remembering what uh, was agreed upon and, you know, what we need the content for. So <clears throat> if I don't need any columns in my model, um, other than coordination effort just to make sure that the space is being taken up by the right size column and maybe I need to wrap it if it's in an open space. Um, then I should turn on, I should delete really all of the columns in this model that I do not need. There's no 
um, if you, know, you want to coordinate with the structural file and stay current with what the engineers are doing uh, on the structural side of things. So having an architectural model with structural columns in it and a structural column or model with columns in it isn't doing anybody any favors. Um, yours may look good for the documentation that you need, but if anything gets moved, you'll have no idea. So I'm just going to go ahead and quickly switch to my 3D view, um, do a full-on window selection here, and filter out any of the structural items that I have placed in the architectural file and delete them. Uh, so in this case, I'm going to go find structural columns. We'll start there. Grab them. Boom, they're gone. Now, it doesn't look like anything changed because that's, that's because I have the exact same set of data in the structural file. Um, so now, uh, so that kind of deals with columns. If, you know, if for some reason you've got columns in an area where they, you're, where that's, or framing for that matter, where it's exposed steel, exposed columns uh, that you want to include inside of an interior rendering for that matter. And you need to be able to see them and you maybe are going to have them painted a certain color. Um, then, yes, you should probably leave those specific items placed in your model um, so that you can adjust materials and such. However, you will need to pay attention to um, the structural model so that if things shift or sizes change, um, shapes change, that you're aware of it and you can make the proper updates as necessary. Um, now, you could always just phone up the structural guy and say, hey, do you mind changing the color of your beams for my renderings? And that'll work too. Um, and it's not a hard change, so if you're lucky, they'll say yes. Um, uh, but where the, where the sticky situations get in are with walls and floors. Um, we'll start with floors because it doesn't take as much of a discussion as walls do. Uh, floors are a big deal um, because on both ends, both groups need floors. Architecturally, we need them so that we can coordinate stair openings, um, elevator shafts, and host content too, potentially, um, uh, for anything that's floor-based or face-based, um, and so on and so forth. There's, there's many reasons why we need to have a floor in our file. Um, structurally, we need to have a floor in the file. If it's concrete on metal deck, I need to be able to see my deck profile when I cut a section through it. Um, I need to be able to adjust what style decking we're using, uh, thickness of concrete, grade of concrete, and then the list goes on. Um, you may even need to throw some slab edges on there and some uh, edge angles and things of that nature. So uh, it's very important that both groups have access to a floor if necessary. Um, now, that being said, it's I would say structure in this case outweighs architectural as far as floors go. Um, so by removing the duplicate here or at least turning it off is a good idea. Um, so in this case, say I want to have my architectural floor and my architectural model stand out. There's a couple of different ways I can go about this. I can go into visibility graphics, go to the Revit link, and this, this holds true with anything, floors, walls, columns, footings, framing, you name it. Uh, anything that's in the structural file and vice versa in the architectural file, we can control graphically how these things are going to be represented in our own models. So what I can do is in the visibility graphics by host view, switch this to custom, um, go to my model tab, switch that to custom as well, and turn off the structural floors. And doing that, it turns them off, and you can kind of see um, a slight change in my views here. If I go ahead and switch, you know, I'll just um, cut a new section here. And I'll just do this. And we'll try it again. So I'm going to go back switch to change my detail level. So here, you know, actually, this is a perfect place to do it. Again, um, I've got two floors in here. Here's the architectural floor right here that I have selected. Here's the structural floor behind it uh, or, or in front of it, however you want to look at that. Um, pick and choose which one you want. So 
you know, if you're in your sections and in your details, if you want to show the deck profiles, then you should turn off your own floors. So it's another visibility graphics, uncheck the box for your floor, um, but you're going to lose structural floor. And that's because the graphical settings are controlled by the host at this point. So architecturally, we turn off floors, we lose everything. So I'm going to undo that. And this is where I need to go to my Revit links and simply set this to custom. I don't have to control anything else. I just got to set it to custom so that when I go back to the my the architectural models model tab, uncheck floors, hit OK, it works. So now I see my structural or the structural's floor, my architectural floor is gone. Um, so graphically, it's cleaner. It's going to look better. Um, now, in the event where your firm is modeling floor finishes, so I've got an extra layer of flooring up here that I just lost because I turned off the architectural floor. Okay. Now, this is where you need to make an another decision as to, well, do I really need to have my subfloor or my concrete on deck floor in the model, or can I just get away with having my finishes listed and then referencing the structural model's floors as necessary? Uh, I would say if you're modeling finishes everywhere, then in most cases, yes, you can get away with not having, um, you know, the concrete on deck flooring beneath it because you'll just use the structural file. Okay. Um, so in this case, then I would reverse it. Well, I would do the same setup, except instead of turning off floors, I would simply delete this one and sh only show my finish. In this case, I'm going to cheat and uh, change, just simply change it to uh, adjust it, really. I'm not going to change anything. So we're going to yank this piece out. And I'm not duplicating. I'm cheating. So don't copy me on this part. All right. And then I'm going to go ahead and make sure that we have the proper offset built in so that it actually sits on top of the concrete on deck floor. Then if for some reason I decide I want to turn the structural model off at this point or do a temp hide to make sure I'm coordinating my architectural elements with each with themselves appropriately, I can do that. So here, my floor is still here. I've got a floor in the physical model so that I can go ahead and still host content to it if necessary. Um, again, I recommend you don't have any hosted content in your projects as much as possible just because it causes issues down the road, but that's a whole other story. Um, so, all right. All right. So, you know, and then on, on the other side, it's the same thing. In the structural file, oops, uh, we're going to have all the architectural floors in here as well. Well, like I said, we need structural floors, don't necessarily need architectural floors. So here's my little cheat sheet here. Boom, all my structural. So I've got duplication of efforts here with the flooring. I have to go ahead and start managing my graphics. Um, Revit links and do that whole process again. Now, another option instead of using visibility graphics because that becomes cumbersome and it can be a lot to manage, um, even if you, you are using view templates, uh, which will push those changes to all similar types of views. Um, uh, you can try uh, utilizing a process uh, uh, that takes advantage of work sharing. Um, a majority of the larger projects inside of Revit are taking advantage of utilizing a central model with work sets. Um, so you can you can set it up this way so that certain elements can be turned you know loaded and unloaded on a kind of as needed basis. Um, so for example, uh, on the architectural side, I can create a work set um, that has you know architectural walls, for example. Um, you know, let's just do this. Um, and you can even preface it with like a coordination prefix or something along those lines so that the structural and even MEP groups know what they're looking for. Um, you know, plumbing fixtures is another thing that, you know, you may need to have in both ARC and MEP models 
don't necessarily need to have them both visible at the same time, but each group might want their own. So again, another way to go about doing this. Um, so if I say coordination of arc walls, and maybe I can go ahead and include floors, uh, columns, let's say. So I've got this new work set, coordination work set, and I can go ahead, sure, and start applying some of these elements to that work set. So I'm just going to do a quick cheat run, select everything in my model again, and um, filter out some stuff, apply it to the work set that I just created, the coordination arc, columns, walls, floors. Uh, come on, filter. There we go. So we're going to go ahead and grab floors and walls. And I already deleted the columns, so we're not going to put that in. So that's easy. So I'll grab these elements and we'll go to properties and I'll just go ahead and add these to my coordination work set. Now, um, some of you may be thinking, well, what if I've got a specific work set break up for my Court, uh, exterior wall elements and interior elements and things of that nature. Well, you know, then as long as that's communicated and it's easy to go ahead and manage those and turn things on and off utilizing these work sets, then it's okay. Um, and just as long as all parties are aware of kind of how you're setting things up so that, you know, we know what to expect. Um, and, this, and that goes both ways. So I'm going to go ahead and sync this up and then switch back to my structure model again and reload it and when I do my reload uh, I can do uh, I can manage these new work sets from here so it's already brought in my coordination arc walls floors and columns so let's just assume which I have I've got the floors in there already I got the walls in there already I don't need any of this at this point I can close it um, and hit reload. It's going to update the file and then all of those architecture elements will be unloaded or removed um, from the current model. And you see some of the stuff disappear. If I switch to a 3D view, all of that information is gone. Okay, uh, That was on that worksheet. Now I didn't grab any of the interior. Uh, these are all demolished so they weren't even visible in that phase. Um, so I didn't, I missed those. Um, and these are all my structural items. And here I missed wall sweeps, so that'd be something I have to go back and add. And it's kind of you gotta kind of check yourself and check and balances on both ends, depending on which direction you're going with this. Um, so, and maybe you don't want to close the work sets actively, um, but even having the work set there allows for um, easier control. Of those of those objects that are hosted to that work set, um, and this also requires that you do some careful work set management uh, on both ends, just to make sure that everything is being um, placed in the proper areas, so that graphically it shows up correctly in the, uh, each other's disciplines files. So uh, now that I've done that, I can go back into my visibility graphics, Revit links, and switch this to custom jump to work sets, switch that to custom, and then physically turn off what I don't need. So in the event uh, that some of those were uh, set up as attachments instead of by overlays, I don't necessarily need to see the architectural references, so I'm going to turn those off. Um, I've got my grid set up in this particular view, which doesn't show grids, but you get the idea. Um, but then I can go ahead and turn off the architectural walls, floors, and columns because I put them all on the same work set. And um, I can hit OK and hit OK again, and all that stuff disappears. Okay, and then I can just go ahead and do my typical visibility graphics on Windows because I personally don't show Windows. Uh, there's no need because structurally they don't we don't have any, and uh, so on and so forth. So <clears throat> managing work sets works uh, really well uh, at the same time, um, and then you can go ahead and apply that to a view template. I'll switch to a floor plan for this. Um, there we go. So I can go ahead and create a view template, and I've already got one called my structural framing plan. 
Um, but this is where I can go ahead and override the Revit link to only show me, you know, what I need. And let's just assume that there, I'm, I leave these on just in case some of their extra stuff appears um, going forward. Um, so if they were to go ahead and to draw a new wall in, it's on the wrong work set. Now I've got a little ch extra check and balance to make sure that they're putting things on the right space so that we can go ahead and verify that elements are coming in the proper positions. Um, but then again, you know, so that's great. I've got my documentation view set up. I'm coordinating back and forth between the two. And I can always go back to my coordination views that I've got set up here to verify that any new walls that have been added, um, I can come make sure that uh, I've got my shear walls drawn in. Um, I've got any concrete wall that I need for reinforcing um, and uh, putting, you know, some firms will have to go ahead and create a bit larger openings for lintels and for headers and uh, maybe to accurately uh, put in a bond beam, for example, um, where architecturally the openings are never that large. Now, um, in some cases, walls can be reused between disciplines. You know, architecturally, if you've got your walls drawn in, um, sometimes you know all structural is not doing anything with it. Maybe it's a wood-framed um, building, and it's a, you know it's interior partition, it's a shear wall, but we're not really analyzing it. We just need to show it in our plan so I can dimension to it and make it look like that I'm hosting um, my joists and. Uh, other framing elements to it. That's fine, um, but to make it easier on the structural user, uh, it might be, it'll, it'll be nice for them, um, and they'll appreciate it a lot if you go through and um, select, you know, whatever handful of walls that would say, well, these aren't shear walls, who am I kidding? Uh, let's say that uh, structurally they need to have these um, foundation walls selectable or referenceable in their documentation sets. Um, so with these selected, I have the ability to change. I guess I've got more than I should have selected here. But what I can do is verify that the structural usage of these walls is set to be something other than non-bearing. It doesn't necessarily need to be shear. It doesn't necessarily need to be bearing or set to structural combined just as long as it's set to something. Um, and really, you can control that by checking the structural box or unchecking it, and that's all it takes nowadays. If you're using older versions of Revit, um, it was just a drop-down. You specified bearing or non-bearing or shear or structural combined. Uh, by default, all architectural walls have that, set, have that setting disabled. So if I draw a new wall in and turn on and link it back into the structural model, I wouldn't see this. Um, but by checking that box, it takes care of it. Graphically, nothing changes in the architectural model. It doesn't adjust anything as far as thickness is. It doesn't give me any extra information that I wouldn't normally need. Um, but it enables the structural users to see that, and now they can they don't have to make any extra tweaks to their graphic standards to um, to reference the information that you've gone ahead and put in. Um, you know, I see this often on a lot of kind of multifamily housing projects, hotels, condos, townhomes, a lot of, a lot of wood framed or stick frame projects um, where you know, we're not doing any analysis with the stick framed walls, but we need to be able to label them accordingly for shear walls and um, uh, represent that we are using those as bearing elements without actually modeling those. Um, which is very common practice um, and could be used in a commercial environment as well where you got steel studs or even concrete walls for that matter. Um, you know, if structurally, if there's no reinforcing going into those walls whatsoever, um, you are okay with the architects throwing their finishes and such on these walls and them showing up in your projects. If you're okay with that, you don't need to draw any walls whatsoever. You can just reference what the architects give you and call it a day. <clears throat> 